Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless these words. I pray, Lord, that you would lead us into understanding. I pray that your word would be attended with the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I, I pray that what is said this morning and what is thought would be pleasing and acceptable to you. We come this morning, Lord, because you have made us the sheep of your pasture. We come this morning because you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for sinners like us. We, we have come this morning because you have poured out grace and mercy upon your people. And so, Lord, we come to worship you, to give you the glory, to thank you, and to sit at your feet. So, Lord, teach us, clear our minds of all that is in the world. To you be the glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, earlier this week, I was at home, and there was a knock on the door. Our dog started barking. And I opened the door, and there was a young man there with a book in his hand. And he said to me, I am a Jewish Gnostic, and I want to tell you how you should live your life, how you can save yourself. To which I responded, how do you think I should do this? How can I save myself? He said, it's obvious that the world is evil. All that is in the world is evil. The only way that you can avoid the temptations of this world is to avoid the things of this world. You must constrain your desires, deprive yourself of the pleasures of this world, and then you might be able to obtain a status of good. Obviously, I'm speaking as a fool. This didn't happen. But this was the heresy that was going on in Ephesus that Paul was battling, that Paul was asking Timothy to, ba to battle. But what happens in real life? By way of application to you and to me, if there's a knock on the door, it's going to be a Jehovah's Witness. It's going to be the Mormons. It's going to be some crazy sect that says that they have the market cornered on truth. The deception is still the same. It's just in a new package. It's just been marketed differently. So while we read, and I, and I think it, it, the, the reason I told that made up story is that I think when we read this and we go, okay, they were dealing with Jewish Gnosticism, something that isn't really defined. I don't know if I'm ever going to come in contact with this. At the same time, we do come in contact with it. It's not called this. It's called something else. Does that make sense? Again, I said it last week, MacArthur breaks down all the religions in the world into two religions, that of divine accomplishment, what God the Father did when he commissioned the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go to the cross, to bear the sins of his people, how he seals his people, how he regenerates his people with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, seals them with the Holy Spirit, that is divine accomplishment. The only other religion of the world, regardless of what you call it, is that of human accomplishment, human achievement, man trying to earn his way to a place where God will accept him. Man can't even get close to achieving what God requires. See Romans 3, starting in verse 10. So I think it would be helpful at this point as we're in this study to define what a false teacher is like these men who were teaching in Ephesus. I, I, I think that it is germane. A false teacher simply is one who is preaching or teaching a false gospel. In other words, someone who is teaching that there is a different way of salvation. 
And this is exactly what Paul writes to the Galatians. He said that you've gone to a different gospel, which isn't really a gospel at all. But a false teacher is someone who is saying that the way to God is different than what Paul has said, what the Bible says. It is different than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reformers crystallized these thoughts for us. They've crystallized, crystallized God's gospel, the biblical gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the phrases that we know that we have been saved by God's grace alone. We have been saved through faith alone, the means by which God saves his people is faith. He gives faith to his people. He also gives repentance, which is a turning away from the other. We can't lose. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. The object of our faith is the Lord Jesus Christ, his perfect life, his sacrificial death, receiving his righteousness. That is the gospel. We are, our faith is in Christ, in Christ alone. We, we say by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to God be the glory. And so that is the gospel. Anything different from this gospel is not the gospel. And the men who purvey something different than this are false teachers. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 1. We went there last week. I think this is very instructive. Starting in verse 6, Galatians 1, 6, Paul writes, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Here it is. Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Go to chapter 3, Galatians 3. Starting in verse 1. In Paul's mind, there's this whole argument between how God is accomplishing salvation for his people and those that are trying to achieve salvation through law keeping. So he says to them, Galatians 3, verse 1, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before, who I, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. The only thing that I want to find out from you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Obviously, hearing by faith. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he, capital H, who provides you with the Spirit, work miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? It's obviously all the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's point is to them. The believer is being led by the Holy Spirit and God's word, the two are working in concert together with us, for us, okay? That is what we are being led by. We are being led by God's word and his spirit. In Ephesus, back to Ephesians, in Ephesus, as we started last Sunday, and we will see again, the men there were misusing the law of God, 
There's two points I want to clarify. I think we need to pull back. We've talked about false teachers, and there's two other things that I want to clarify before we dive into this. There, on one hand, you have false teachers. On the other hand, you have teaching in error. There are men who proclaim the gospel correctly in churches today, but in some form of ignorance, you, they can also teach in error. My, my prayer for me, for all of us here, is that we do not, in ignorance, teach in error. There's a difference between teaching something in ignorance, not knowing, but teaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and teaching a false way of salvation. There's a difference between the two. We're, we're, the last time I checked, we were all men and we're all sinners. The second point that I want to clarify is that is very germane to these verses is the question of motive, okay? What is the motive of the false teacher? the one who is proclaiming a different way of salvation. Why is he teaching what is he te why is he teaching what he's teaching? For whose glory is he teaching? Is he teaching for his own glory? Or is he teaching for the glory of God? Only the believer that is indwelt by the Spirit can begin to do things for the glory of God. Everything else Man is doing for himself. And so, as Titus, flip to Titus 1. As Paul writes to Titus. Starting in verse 10, Titus 1.10. These are... Those of the circumcision, they're Jewish. Verse 10, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, i.e. Jewish, who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things that they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. It, it's money. Only the believing preacher can begin to Seek to do the things for God, for his glory, and the power of the Spirit. The false teacher is a slave to his own sin, and thus all he can do is seek to satisfy himself. That's the danger of the false teachers. It is always gets so twisted because it is looking to glorify man in some way, shape, or form, and not that of God. So in our verses today, I want to read verse 7 again because it's germane to what we're talking about, even though we're starting in verse 8. I've got it marked in my Bible, and I can't find it. Here we go. Verse 7, Paul makes a statement. Wanting to be teachers of the law, capital L, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters by which they make confident assertions. Again, from last week, these false teachers are prominent members of the local church. They may be elders, deacons. They are setting themselves up to be teachers, but a specific type of teacher. They want the prestige of being teachers of the law, being teachers of the Mosaic law. The teachers of the Mosaic law were the Jewish rabbis. They wanted to be treated and honored in the same way that the Jewish rabbis were honored. But Paul says they have no idea what they're even saying. And most dangerously about it, they're saying it confidently, okay? So I've broken our, our verses 8 through 11 into three sections. Verse 8a, the beginning of verse 8, is the character of the law. The character of the law. Paul writes at the beginning of verse 8, 
But we know that the law is good. The law in mind here, the law in view here that Paul is talking about is the law that God gave Moses in Exodus 20 on Mount Sinai, and specifically we're referring to the Ten Commandments. The law is instructive. The first four commandments that God gives Moses talk about man's relationship and man's responsibility to God himself. The six next commandments, the, the following six commandments, tell man his responsibility, what is required of him to his fellow man. So we have God and then man, okay? Paul gives us commentary on this in Romans 7. Go back to Romans 7. Gives us commentary on this being the law specifically. Romans 7. The character of the law. Verse 12. Romans 7, 12. Paul writes... In this whole deal, he's talking about sin, the exposure of sin, but there are these nuggets in here where he reveals what the law is. Verse 12, so then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The, the law personifies the character of who God is. The Lord is holy. He is righteous. He is good. Go down to verse 16, the last half of verse 16. Paul says, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. The law, let me say it again, reveals God's character. The law tells men who are created by their God who their God is. All the things in the law are God's word. It's biblical. It is what ultimately God's people should do, okay? Have no other gods before me. So the character of the law is good. It reveals God. It reveals his holiness. Second point, the purpose of the law, starting in 8b, going to verse 10, The law is good. Here's where it starts. If one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. There are, so, so it begs the question when we read this, purpose of the law. What is the purpose of the law? Unfortunately, in the Christian life, men make one of two errors with the law. We either become legalist, we fall into the trap of legalism where we go beyond the law where we put a superstructure around the law of do's and don'ts. Kent tells me that I'm a linear thinker. I do a lot of projects, and in my mind, it's always, how do I get from A to D? I've got to go A to B, B to C, C to D. There's always a step. We'll go shopping, and my wife will tell us, tell me we're shopping for this, and I'm like, okay, net it out for me. Tell, tell, me, tell me what we're, what we're really doing. Man in his heart wants a list of rules and regulations. I want a step-by-step -step process on how to be a Christian. If I do all these things and check all these boxes, am I good? That's in the heart of man. And that's why it's so easy for man to follow, fall into legalism. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ is our guide. 
He is the pattern we are to follow. He is the one who has saved us. We're not our own. We're being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's like the wind. We don't know where we're going. The Lord knows, and that's good enough for the believer. The other is we fall into this antinomian, this almost this against law that can take the form of licentiousness. And we tend to fall in one camp or the other, and it's so hard to keep upright on that horse and to follow what, the, what God intends in his word. Luther gave two purposes for the law. Calvin built on that. Luther gave two purposes for the law. Number one, it was for the use of society. Specifically, the law, do not murder, do not commit adultery, was a pattern by which, in our case, government or the rulers could set society up in a way that was promoted well-being for everybody, okay? The second purpose of the law, which is what Paul has in view here in this section, is the law reveals sin. The law reveals that you and I, being sinners, born into sin, cannot keep this holy law. We will break this law. So the whole purpose in Luther's mind was that the law reveals that God is holy and man is not. Calvin added a third, and it's not really in view here in what we're talking about, but just so you have it in your mind, the means, he, he added that the law was a pattern of life and sanctification, that ultimately Christ fulfilled the law, we follow the law of Christ, Christ, we thought the law said this, Christ further explained it, and the calling's even higher, okay? But that's not really in view here, but that is the third part of the law. The law reveals sin, and it reveals the need for a savior, okay? Go back to Romans chapter three. The law reveals that God is holy, and we are not. Romans 3, verse 20, second half of the verse. We'll get to the first half of the verse, second half of the verse. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Go to chapter 7 again, Romans 7. Further up in the discussion with Paul, starting in verse 7, Romans 7, 7. What shall I say then? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I, Paul, would have not come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have come to know about coveting if the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Sin isn't exposed. The law is the light that exposes the sin, in other words. Verse 9, for I, once, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. We learn that we are sinners in the law, okay? Galatians 3, go back to Galatians 3. What is the purpose of the law in Paul's mind here about the gospel, about a false gospel, about the way to the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul has in mind here. And he says in Galatians 3, and I'm in verse 24,
Therefore, the law has become our tutor. And that tutor there, the, the, the Romans hire, used to hire the Greeks as slaves. They had a slave, and the, and the slave would be the master of a young child. They would come into the house, and they would constrain or teach and be very strict upon the child, okay? The, the, it was a temporary position until the child became a man. Therefore, the law became our tutor. It's that slave guarding, guardian to train us up. Therefore, the law became our tutor to lead us to Christ. The result of the law is that when you realize that you're a sinner, you have no hope. You have fallen short of what God requires. You've missed the mark. And at that point, you have no hope unless the Lord intervenes. The law, the knowledge of sin, leads us to the need of a Savior. It points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. Go back to 1 Timothy. Verse 8, purpose of the law. But we know that the law is good, here it starts, if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law was not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious. The right use of the law is not to justify yourself to God by law-keeping. Let me repeat that. The right use of the law is not to justify yourself before God, God by law-keeping. It is to tell you that you need a Savior. It's to reveal, to reveal your sin. The law by the Jews was viewed as one. It was viewed as a whole. It was broken. We sometimes break it, ceremonial, moral, civil law, but they viewed the law as a unit, as one. And when one point of the law is broken, which all sinners do, the entire law is broken. You've lost the game. I, I, I used to think of this when I was younger, I messed around with tennis for a little while. And, and if you've ever played tennis, you typically need somebody else to play with you. If, you. if you don't have anybody else to play with you and your park had a wall with a line on it and half of a court, you would hit the ball into the wall, you're never going to win a point against the wall. The ball's always coming back. You're losing. You could hit the ball 50, the ball's coming back. That's the law. It's such an exacting standard. You're never going to win. James says this. You don't have to turn there. James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. You fail in one point, you've lost. Game over. There is no... Achievement of righteousness by man by keeping the law. And whoever teaches that by, and there's people today that still teach that if you keep the law, salvation can be achieved. That is a false message. That is a false doctrine. That is a false gospel if, you, if we could even go there. That's why Luther always believe that when you went to share Christ with somebody, you started with the law to tell them that they were a sinner in the need of a savior. They had no hope. They could not achieve any sort of justification from God. And then you told them about the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through faith in someone else, you could get a foreign righteousness that's credited to your account so that when the Father looked at you, he saw not your sin, but the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luther always said, 
gospel, law, and then gospel. Lawson, if you were here several re- weeks ago, he preached it. He preached it hard. Repentance and faith, they're two sides of the same coin. In order to be truly saved, you have to repent of your life outside of Christ, repent of your sins, and that picture of repentance is turning from that life to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no faith without repentance. It's, it's what the law gives us. It's your repenting of sin. Righteousness, which is being declared righteous by God, we call that justification, has always been through the means of faith. Old Testament, New Testament, it has always been by, through the means of faith. Paul is telling us that the law is not righteous with respect to salvation because they are already righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has already paid for their sins, past, present, and future. So Paul is making a distinction between those that are already saved and those who have not been saved. He's looking at those, again, the the picture, the focus here is salvation. And so Paul says, the law is not for the righteous, not as a pattern of life, not as what Calvin talked about. But the law is not for the believer, the righteous, because they've already been saved out of their sin. The law is for the unrighteous. If you remember, in God's salvific economy, Abraham was saved in Genesis 15, 6. He was saved by faith. God took him outside, showed him the stars of the heaven. One of those stars would have been brighter. It would have been the Lord Jesus Christ said he believed and it was credited to his account. God credited that righteousness. It was through the means of faith. It wasn't until 430, 50 years later that the law came to Moses on Mount Sinai. Salvation in the Old Testament, salvation in the New Testament, salvation has always been by faith. We got people that get so confused. I, I thought that God's standard was different in the old. It's always been the same. Law was to show them that they needed a Savior. Go back to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, starting in verse 20. Here's the death nail to the law keeper. Because by the works of the law, verse 20, Romans 3, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, God's sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And here's the good news. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested in the law. Lord Jesus Christ, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Go forward to chapter 8. You're not going to be saved in law keeping. You've already, but by the time you even know the game has started, you've already lost the game. Okay? By the time you even know that you're supposed to keep the law, you've lost. Chapter 8, starting in verse 3. Here it is again. Paul writes, for what the law could not do save men. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Christ fulfilled the law. Again, why is the law not for the righteous man? Because our righteousness, our law keeping was accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's without sin. We have his righteousness, a foreign righteousness. Okay? Go forward to chapter 10. Just in case we miss the point. All right? Paul gives this beautiful ministry paradigm, starting in verse 14. God sends the preacher. They preach the message, the, the good news. That's how they believe. He says it all in reverse. And the climax is in verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That is the means of salvation. Go back to 1 Timothy. If you can, it might be interesting to hold your finger in 1 Timothy and at the same time hold your other finger, if you have more than one fingers, in Exodus chapter 20. When Paul gives this list... And we don't want to be on this list. He has the Mosaic law. Specifically, he has the Ten Commandments in view. I'm I'm just going to, in Exodus 20, I just want to sort of frame this in our minds. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's all about how we are to approach God. Well, these first words that are used here, there's six of them, they're in pairs, all condemn man against the first four commandments, which is in Exodus 20, verse 3, 4, 7. Listen to these words. But for those who are lawless, this is God's law. That means destitute of law, rebellious, disobedient against God, ungodly. This is the very God that we are to worship. Sinners, those who've missed the mark, unholy, God is holy, profane. The word profane there means common, okay? We, We use the other word is like vulgar. There's things were created for common use or they were set aside to be holy. And so all these are in a contrast for who God is and how these men have fallen short of what God requires. You don't have to turn there, but you know these verses. In Matthew 22, starting in verse 36, the Someone comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, I think it was a lawyer, and said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And he he responds, and this is the call of the Christian. This summarizes these first four commands in Exodus 20. Christ said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Look at the next list of words in Timothy. Those who kill their mother, father and mothers, murderers, immoral men, that means fornicators, homosexuals, kidnappers. Kidnappers are those who steal humans. It was the highest form of stealing, liars, perjurers. Exodus 20, the law, starting in verse 12. The fifth commandment, Honor your father and your mother. Don't kill them. Verse 13, you shall not murder murderers. There was manslayers, I think, in one of the versions. Verse 14, the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Immoral men, fornicators, homosexuals. 
The Eighth Commandment, verse 15, you shall not steal kidnapping. Again, that was the highest form. The rabbis considered that the highest form of stealing, stealing a person. The Ninth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Liars and perjurers, those men who cannot tell the truth. Paul is, is taking them and saying, okay, you think you can be justified by the law? This is what you are. And he literally systematically is going down the Mosaic law and just checking it off box by box. He's saying these words in this order, divinely inspired for a purpose to make the point. They're lawbreakers, okay? He ends this list with sort of a catch-all. And whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. It's almost like if I missed anything, anything that stands against sound teaching. This word sound teaching is this word that's so important to Paul. He uses it seven more times in this single letter to Timothy. It, it, it means healthy or wholesome doctrine. It, the, the image that Paul has in his mind here is spiritually healthy doctrine. All these things, Paul says, stand in opposition to sound biblical doctrine. If you go forward, if you're in 1 Timothy, go forward. One of the times he uses it is in chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 6. Remember, the reason you, the, the reason in Paul's letters, it was doctrine, 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 application, application, application. Doctrine is practical. Doctrine is the anchor in which we anchor our lives that we can live for Christ. Doctrine tells us who God is and who man is. It is the most important thing we can understand is God's doctrine, biblical doctrine. People will tell you doctrine is divisive, Doc doctrine divides. I hope it does. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what Matt says. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you say. It only matters what God says. This is his world and we're living in it. He's told us how we are to approach him. It's through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're about to be about the Lord's business because we're the Lord's people, I think we ought to know what he wants us to do. It's biblical doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 6. In pointing these things out to the brethren, you, Timothy, will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, constantly nourished on the words of faith and of sound doctrine, there it is, which you have been following. We've had the purpose of the law. The first point was the character of the law, the purpose of the law, and now we have the remedy, verse 11, to the law's demand. The remedy to the law's demand, which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, the remedy of the law's demands. Paul writes, after he said all these things, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Paul concludes this section that started in verse 3, what he's been saying about the law, the purpose of the law, the rightful use of the law. And he says, all these things I've been saying are in accord to the gospel of that I've been given by God himself through divine inspiration. This is the glorious gospel. That word glorious is doxa, doxology. 
It literally means the gospel tells us of the glory of God. Dr. Johnson said it this way when he was talking about this in the glorious gospel. He says, this glorious gospel tells of his power, God's power, of his majesty, of his compassion in the person and work of Jesus Christ, why the law tells of man's sinfulness, but the gospel tells us of the remedy in the compassion and saving ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. These men are false teachers. They're teaching that salvation can be accomplished through some sort of law-keeping. And Paul says the answer is in the gospel. That is, that is one, of the, one of the tenets of this church is to share the gospel with the lost. Because it is, it is the means of salvation by which God draws his, him, his people to himself. That's the means. Sharing Christ, telling them of their need, sharing Christ. I love the way Dr. Johnson says that. In closing, let me just say this. The law reveals the holiness of God and what he requires. And what he requires is perfect righteousness. The gospel tells us that we can be righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't do this on our own. That's why when we step back from this entire conversation and topic, the reason that God gets the glory is because he's done it all. Because you and I can't do it. Are you a product of grace or are you a product of works? I hope you're a product of grace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. I thank you, Lord, that you have shown your people grace and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ that you came to seek and to save those who were lost. Lord, that you have done for your people what your people could not do for themselves. I pray, Lord, that, that we would avail ourselves to you using us. Use us for your glory. Lord, if there's someone here who does not know Christ, I pray that you would draw them even today if you be so willing that you would circumcise the heart and that you would cause the scales to fall from their eyes. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.